Hello again to everyone watching. Um, for those who are tuning in just now, my name is Pravini Baburam and I'm a program manager at ECHO. And for the coming 45 minutes, I will um, invite you to join the Power Walk. This is an exercise to engage people in um, stepping into someone else's shoes and trying to imagine what it's like to navigate the world and more specifically an academic environment um, in, in someone else's shoes and someone who is underrepresented, perhaps someone who deviates from your own identity and um, experience. And we have a couple of volunteer participants uh, with us today. So I'm going to introduce them uh, to you. We have Angelica Monteiro from the University of Porto. Um, thank you so much for being here today, Angelica. We have Annabelle Yale from Echo University. So glad you could join us today, Annabelle. Glad to be here, yeah. thank you. Nick Herens um, with the Knowledge Innovation Center, my colleague from the Netherlands. <laughs> Good to have you here. And um, um, we have Daniela Jaramillo Dent from the University of Huelva in Spain. <laughs> I have practiced this, people. <laughs> so um, again, I'm really happy that you can join us to um, participate in this exercise. And um, Nick, Angelica, Daniela, and Annabelle will also share their reflections with us uh, after the exercise. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen. And um, invite you to join. So what are we going to do? First, we have to set the stage a little bit. As I mentioned, we're going to step into someone else's shoes. So um, what I'm going to ask everyone within this uh, session and also you watching at home, to take a um, uh, pen and paper, or if you're, you know, you're watching on your uh, device, use your device, and come up with an identity that is different from your own. And I'll help you to create that identity. You can think of specific identity markers that are different from your own. And you can think of um, uh, at, at least three dimensions and choose two of those dimensions that uh, deviate from your own. So uh, you can think of gender. So think about either male, female, non-binary or otherwise. You can think in terms of ethnicity, white, black, Asian or otherwise. You can think of sexual identity or orientation, uh, heterosexual, gay, bisexual or otherwise. Or you can think in terms of academic background. So no family experience in higher education, no recent educational experience or an alternative entry uh, qualification or otherwise. So if I were to come up with an identity for this specific exercise, I could, for instance, come up with an identity that is male because I identify as female, um, an identity that is white because I identify as, as uh, Asian, more specifically Indo-Caribbean, and um, uh, an identity based on um, a heterosexual identity, uh, which aligns with how I identify. I identify as heterosexual. So this means that two of my identity markers are different from my own. Now, the people in this, uh, our volunteer participants, are now also invited to come up with an identity. And also you at home, I invite you to join this exercise and come, come up with your own identity. So I'll give you a moment to, um, to write it down. What we're going to do is I'm going to present you 10 statements. And I'm going to ask you to answer these statements from your specific perspective related to this identity that you just came up with. So you won't be answering the statements from your own perspective, but from someone else's perspective. With each statement, you can write down 
scores or points, depending on how you answer. And at the end of the statements, I'm going to ask you to calculate your score, your total score. And um, then I'm going to ask the volunteer participants here uh, today to share their scores and then reflect on those scores. What does it mean if you have a high or low score? And what does that say about your um, a position of power in the academia uh, and more broadly in society? And what can we learn from that in relation to sense of belonging? So that is the exercise we're going to do. And I'm going to check with the volunteer participants. Are you all set to continue? Can I ask you about the scoring? Is, it, is 10 a high score? Um, yes, you can. Uh, if, if you agree with the statement, you can write uh, down 10. But with each statement, I'll uh, repeat uh, how many scores and what does that, uh, how many points and what does that mean for, um, for your calculation? Great. So you can just um, go with the flow. And if you have questions during the flow, then let me know. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We're going to start and I'm going to uh, present you with the first statement. Um, oh, and before I uh, forget to mention, you can answer the statements in relation to your um, context and specifically your institution. So uh, you can take your institution, your higher education institution as the context for answering these uh, statements. All right. I have to quit something, otherwise I'm going to hear this. My apologies. And now I'm going to go back. Here we go. First statement. I can ask my parents for help in navigating the university. If you agree with the statement from your new identity, you can write down 10 points. If you disagree, write down zero. And if you are in doubt or partially agree, you can write down five. I can ask my parents for help in navigating the university. The second statement, I recognize the history of my ancestors in my curriculum. So if you agree with this statement from your new identity, you can write down 10 points. If you disagree, write down zero. And if you're in doubt, partially agree, but I recognize the history of my ancestors in my curriculum. Third statement, my voice and experiences are represented in the student bodies of the university. My voice and experiences are represented in the student bodies of the university. All right. Statement four, I recognize myself in the teaching staff. I recognize myself in the teaching staff. Heading to statement five. I can participate in my classes without encountering any challenges. And just like the statements before, if you agree, write down 10 points, disagree zero, and if you're in doubt or partially agree, five. We're halfway there. <laughs> Next statement. I see myself reflected in communication materials published by the university. I see myself reflected in communication materials published by the university.
going to statement seven. I am seldom confronted with stereotypes about my community. I am seldom confronted with stereotypes about my community. Statement eight. If I address something I consider inappropriate, I'm not worried people would think I'm oversensitive. If I address something I consider inappropriate, I'm not worried people will think I'm oversensitive. If you agree with the statement, 10 points. If you're in doubt or partially agree, five. And if you disagree, zero points. Going to statement nine, I know where to go within the university if I need support. I know where to go within the university if I need support. And then the last statement, my experience at the university is empowering and has strengthened my confidence. My experience at the university is empowering and has strengthened my confidence. If you agree, 10 points, partially agree or doubt five and disagree zero. All right, so I hope um, you all have been able to respond and know that your scores. So now is the time to calculate your total score. And actually, for those uh, who are um, joining the exercise uh, at home, you're also, if you want, you're also uh, invited to, uh, to share your scores and reflections in the chat um, and see uh, if there are people who maybe recognize the reflections of our volunteer participants. I see um, Angelica has already submitted your scores and I see you have noted 20 points Angelica so yeah. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now and uh, start inviting you for your reflection so first let me ask you how did you experience this exercise how was it for you it was very interesting because uh, we always think about other people and in other cultures, but it's different to think that I am this person to put myself to walk in someone else's shoes. So it's very, very interesting. It's, it's very reflexive to it's a, a nice exercise. I think we should do that more often <laughs> because it's really, really, really very interesting. And I, I really think that at my university, we have lots of uh, opportunities and, and not that much trouble. But I was, I can tell, I was a man, a uh, refugee, bisexual. <laughs> so <laughs> there are lots of things. Because uh, actually, I am from, I live in Portugal, but I'm from Brazil and I have lots of students from Brazil. But I thought that this would be very easy because <laughs> I really am also from another country. So I have to find something else. And then that's why I try to be a man, to think about all these issues, being yeah. man, black, refugee, and bisexual. Um, these 12, uh, these uh, 20 points, Actually, there are lots of things that I really haven't think about that. 
So I choose to put no points, to put zero, <laughs> when I think that this must be very difficult. But yeah. I also, also think that we nowadays have a very um, supportive structure here in our university. So the only 10 points was for the to how to find support. I think even our university have uh, lots of structures to, to support students, I think that. And also I think that the when I talk to the students, the experience of being here, being abroad, is very um, uh, powerful experience. They learn a lot. So the last one, I always think that it's very difficult. There are lots of difficulties. Uh, I think most of them don't have, can't talk with their parents about academic issues because they have other problems because of the language, because it's another word, completely another word. Some of them with low classifications, low qualifications, low education levels. So I don't think they can talk to their parents, but uh, I don't think they see themselves in the teaching staff not at all, and not on the communication materials, not, not of them, but actually it was the first time that I, I was confronted to think that way. So this law qualifications because I haven't to think about that, and I am sure that I have to think more about that. It was very, very, very useful and very interesting experience. Thank you. Great. Well, Angelica, you covered so much already <laughs> in your reflection. That's amazing. Thank you so much. So just to, uh, to summarize, if I understand you correctly, you chose to um, step into the shoes of a, a man with a refugee background who is Black and bisexual. And bisexual. Yes. And you have all these different elements, these intersectional elements um that uh, show how difficult it can be if you have that specific uh, combination of identity markers what i also heard you say was that even though you talk a lot about these issues and about these um experiences it was a whole nother um level of understanding by actually trying to imagine what it's like to navigate the university with that specific identity and also that um, even though you yourself come from abroad, um, it was still hard to yes. see uh, what it must be like, you know, with that specific. Uh, so even when you think, you know, you actually don't know until you have to answer those specific questions. So um, thank you so much, Angelica. Thank I think you. it was really, really rich. And I'm really curious also, obviously, to hear how um, the other participants um, experienced it. So I see Nick um, has submitted 39 points um, and I see all, also the rest coming in. So uh, I'll start with Nick. Um, how was it for you, this exercise and um, which identity do you choose? Um, I, I find it very interesting. Um, uh, I find it also quite um, complicated to some extent to, to juggle the different parts of an identity. Um, so um, I think I might come across as more positive than others, but in, when I did the scoring, I actually felt very negative about the scoring, I, but I did not want to give too many zeros. I've, I had a lot of ones and twos, uh, <laughs> and in two occasions an eight uh, as well. Well, I, I, I tried to stay very close to, to myself because I, 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 I imagined uh, a former colleague of mine before this job, I was working for a charity where we worked with deaf people. And one of my colleagues was a deaf woman. Uh, and she was the first uh, person in her family to, to go to higher education. So those are the identity markers that I kept, that I, that I changed. But then I also had my own identity markers, which was um, uh, gay coming from uh, a single parent family uh, and obviously a white man. So uh, white will still be there, uh, obviously not men. Uh, so, so I tried to juggle a little bit, not completely losing also my own um, um, issues that I've had, but focusing mainly on, uh, on my former colleague and friend uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a deaf British woman. Um, so my scores were a bit of a mix. Uh, so uh, obviously being um, a white woman uh, studying in Britain, um, I, I would recognize quite a lot in the curriculum and I would also uh, I certainly feel very empowered because, uh, it, it, as is the case with her reality, 
Um, um, she never ex expected that she could go to higher education. Um, when she grew up, uh, her, her mother is deaf, um, which is also true. And, and, and she would never, she never even had a chance to go beyond primary school. Um, and for her, for my friend, um, it actually was quite liberating that with a lot of struggles, having to go to open university and doing courses there, that was the only op opportunity to really prepare herself for higher education. But once she was in higher education, of course, it was already very empowering in itself. So in some ways, the experience of being there was, was super positive. And also the university, which I looked at my own university here uh, in the UK, actually, um, they were quite good when it comes to offering support. Um, uh, there was a lot of support uh, available, but on the same time, it's not very easy for a student or for, for her to actually know what support is available and to having always had to find her own way. Uh, she doesn't always appreciate that you can get more support uh, and, and more like exceptional circumstances, having extra time, etc. On the same time, um, um, couldn't ask a parent for support because obviously um, a parent would know anything about higher education. I uh, don't really recognize myself uh, in my teachers. Um, there, there are obviously, yeah, there are, there's no, 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 no teachers with, a, with a, an obvious disability uh, in, 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 in my school. Um, also, what is really difficult is uh, struggling with fellow students who don't really appreciate that um, my first language is actually not English, but it's British Sign Language, which um, I don't think anyone really seems to understand around me. Uh, and because of that, I'm struggling with, uh, with language, I'm struggling with writing. So even with all the supports, um, it's very difficult to, to still cope with the expected level. Um, also, I don't really recognize myself in student, uh, student representative bodies, because even though there is a, uh, a disability officer, which is quite well um, arranged here in the UK, um, it, it, at the moment, this is not someone who is, who is deaf. Um, so disabilities are also very different. Um, so, so I don't really recognize myself there, although I do know that I can find support. Um, so I think those are, those are more or less the, the rounded figures. So I, I still feel that um, I, said, I thought it was a bit too harsh to, to say zero to almost everything, but most of the, apart from indeed uh, recognizing the curriculum somehow and finding support, everything is below, well, below uh, the medium. Uh, yeah. so it, it is a real struggle uh, in, in, this, in this personality. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nick, also for your uh, layered also reflection. And what I hear from your um, perspective is that there are on some dimensions, a lot of um, room for recognition, specifically being a white woman and on other dimensions, specifically, you know, being um, deaf, um, it poses uh, a lot of challenges. And what I also find interesting is that you actually took uh, someone you know as a, a frame, um, a point of reference, right? So I think this is actually one of the um, questions that comes up in this specific exercise is to what extent are you familiar with the identity and the perspective you chose? Is that a perspective that you are familiar with because you have people in your surroundings who share their experiences and their challenges and their dilemmas? Um, or is it something you only heard or read about and you're not really sure how to engage with the questions because you don't know anyone uh, with that lived experience? So it's really nice, uh, Nick, to hear from you that you were able to um, take her um, experience and use that to uh, navigate this uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Daniela, who mentions 15 points in the chat. Hi, How hello. Exercise, and what are some of the reflections yeah. you want to share? So let me tell you first a little bit about the identity that I chose. So I am actually an immigrant in Spain. I am from Ecuador. But of course, I am very aware of my privilege as an immigrant who looks more like people look here. I speak the language, right? Then the religious, the, the religion here is very important. So here they're Catholic. And even though I am not, I do understand Catholicism and everything. So I chose a, a Moroccan man who is Muslim. And why did I choose this profile? Because uh, I, I'm doing a doctorate on, uh, the, on representations of immigration. So uh, in, the, in the area where I live in southern Spain, there's a, a huge Muslim uh, Moroccan population. 
but they are not everywhere. Like there is very separate spheres where these populations uh, operate. And, and it's interesting because um, they, there's a large population, but they are not in university. They go to certain schools. There seems to be a very, very divided uh, community. Uh, so uh, another interesting thing is that the culture here in Andalusia is very, like when you come from, from another country is very obviously um, it's very Ar Arabic. The music is Arabic. Like everything that they hold dear as their culture is very close to, you know, a lot of words come from um, from Arabic and everything. So uh, it was interesting because, uh, so those were the three things that I uh, took, like I changed, but then uh, one of the questions made me think about my own situation, right? Because I didn't change everything. For example, about the parents, asking your parents for, for information. So my parents went to college, but in a, I've lived in three different countries in the States and in Spain, and I'm from Ecuador. So when, even if your parents went to college, if it's not in the same country where you are going, it, you have to learn it completely. So when you're immigrating, it's a huge um, uh, hurdle, even if your parents are educated. Like, so I get the Moroccan man, his parents are educated, but he cannot ask them because they don't know. Uh, and then also about the history, right? Uh, if you get their perspective. So I would say here in Spain, they would give you some history about what Morocco is, but they'll give you the perspective from Spain because Sp Spain is a very colonialist country. So here they tell you their story. So they actually tell me the story of my country. I'm like, no, but they tell me. So I, I can imagine that that would be really, really strong. Uh, there are no professors who look like me. Uh, there are no students who look like me, very, very few. And uh, the materials do not apply to anything. No one looks like me there. People look like me. They could look like me, but they are Spaniards. So this is another interesting thing. Spain racially is very mixed, but nobody accepts that that could be from the centuries of more of, of, of Arabic uh, ruling, right? And then it, 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 there was a question who said, is there somewhere where you can get help? And I thought, yes, I know there's a department where there they is supposed to help me, but I don't know if they would be able to help me because I, I don't think they would understand or they would be trained. They haven't been exposed to people like me. That's what I thought. Um, and then about being oversensitive, that was interesting because right now in Spain, the thinking is that everyone is oversensitive. So women are oversensitive, uh, people who want inclusive language. So there's a huge, so everyone. So we just have to keep it as it is, right? So I would say, yes, definitely. I would be oversensitive. Um, uh, they help. And I think that was, yeah, that was all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Daniela. What I find really, really um, interesting in your reflection is <clears throat> even when you uh, recognize uh, some of the statements in terms of uh, responding to it in a positive way, um, there are still uh, additional layers to challenge, right? So the specific example you give of uh, recognizing the history of your ancestors in the curriculum, uh, factually, yes. But in terms of narrative and perspective, that's up for debate. And I think um, the specific context of the colonial history that you um, address also in relation to Andalusia, obviously, where um, uh, um, uh, Granada played an important role in the, in the conquest, um, the Spanish conquest, and also uh, what that means for someone like you from Ecuador, who has that colonial relationship uh, the fact that you speak Spanish is part of that history, <laughs> you know, that also comes up now in, in this specific uh, exercise. So, um, and also, you know where to go for support, yes, but are they able to help you is another, uh, is another um, discussion. So um, I really appreciate uh, the way you um, put even the statements that um, would um, imply that there is a sense of belonging that even then we have to ask critical question, but what does it actually mean in relation to um, these specific identities? So thank you so much, Daniela, for, uh, for that reflection. And then uh, last but not least, Annabelle, I'm very curious to hear from you. You mentioned you have 30 points. 
um, which identity did you choose and how did you experience this exercise? Um, yeah, where do I start really? Um, I think overall it was quite an uncomfortable experience, I have to say. And, and I think, you know, part way through, I thought it made me realise that I'm part of the problem. <laughs> so my, I, I, my university is where I went to university as a um, mature student, mother of four. That's, so I retained those characteristics. I retained that, yeah, that I was a mature student. So the university that I go to is, and, and I lecture at is a widening participation university in the northwest of England. But the, what it tends to attract is people from the, the local area and its widening participation aspects tend to fo focus on, um, you know, raising, uh, you know, lower socioeconomic classes and uh, first, you know, encouraging people to go to university. And so it attracts a lot of people from the Northwest. So it's not very culturally diverse. I think Liz knows the university well. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Liz? <laughs> um, so... Uh, my the characteristics that I changed were um, that I was a black male. Um, so I was a black male and I had, because I, I also work in early years and I think that's an important, um, so my background is psychology. So I've got experience in other things, but I was looking at this guy's experience in early years education. And one of the, one of the issues within early years education is that it's very gendered and it, it typically attracts women because it's, it's quite low paid, it's a caring profession, lots of issues. So one of the key debates in early years education is there's not enough men. It doesn't attract a lot of men. And I just think there are so many barriers to attracting men to start off with, you know, not even considering that the, the, um, the different ethnicity there. Um, and I realised when I was thinking about it that, that I'd, I'd sort of um, gone, gone for these, these identity markers because I, I also have uh, taught on the, there's a fast track programme that the university offers, which is a six week programme for non-traditional students who don't, as in they don't have the, um, they, they might have non-traditional uh, educational the, 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 you know they haven't got the, the amount of credits or whatever so it's a six-week program giving access to education and I remember teaching a guy on there who was a black middle-aged male um, who had a family and he he didn't complete the program there were so many barriers for him um, that it just became insurmountable and I, I remember you know again tr trying to support him the best that I could but but Looking at the, going through this experience today, I realise all those different layers and how insurmountable. And for me, as a middle-aged woman, those a lot of those barriers were there. Um, I, I, you know, but as as a as a black male, um, they became I think they become quite insurmountable. So you know, there was there was a big fat zero for representing you know for staff representation because as I said, I'm part of the problem. There are um, I'd say about eighty percent of the staff are um, middle aged women, <laughs> and there are two two blokes and they're both gay. Um, so it's not very representative, I don't think. And um, in terms of, you know, knowing whether they are represented in the community more widely, um, I think the university gives it a good go. Um, but I also think, you know, ha as, a, as an older man, the, there, are, there is less, rep there's, there's less representation there. And also, you know, the course uh, that I lead is it typically attracts younger females. So, um, and because he's got English as an additional language, there's, there's lots of different layers to it. So I started ranking very low to start off with. And I, I think I did something similar to what Nick was describing. I, I started thinking, you know, the bit, a bit more optimistic and I'm, I'm being a bit too negative about this. And I'm really, you know, we should, we should be able to help this guy. And I'm a big advocate of the personal tutoring system. So I was thinking, you know, if I was this personal tutor, you know, this is what I could do. This is, this is how I might help. Um, but but I just think there's there's some huge challenges there that uh, yeah so I'm hopeful but the reality is <laughs> I'm not sure. 
thank you uh, so much, Annabelle, also for your um, your honest uh, reflections in in the, in the sense that it's uncomfortable, you know, and and I think um, that is actually part of this process, you know, what we call getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's really important to let that in and to reflect on what that means also for uh, for your institution and what that means also for people who have to experience the discomfort every day, you know, um, navigating the university. Um, and I really appreciate that you address that specific um, aspect of the conversation. So thank you uh, for that. Thank you. Um, we have five minutes left before we have to wrap up this exercise. And I just wanted to thank you again for the, the rich reflections we've heard from Angelica on the importance of um, imagining what it's like to be in someone else's shoes um, rather than talking about it. You know, from Nick, we've learned it's, it's really helpful to take someone within your uh, surroundings to you're familiar with to um, um, tap into that lived experience Daniela um, engaged us in a critical reflections on even if we think, you know, we uh, we are inclusive, there are still additional layers to um, to explore and to uh, critically reflect on. And Annabelle addressed the process of getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. So in that sense, we have a lot of different um, angles to um, to this conversation of sense of belonging. So thank you all for for addressing that. Um, I think also one of the most important questions after doing this exercise is what's next, right? Now that we know um, the gaps and the, the specific aspects that are um, posing challenges and uh, might um, make people feel um, excluded or actually exclude them because of the structures that they um, encounter, uh, the question now becomes what can we do to um, make them more inclusive? specifically in your own role within the institution. And with the five minutes we have left, I want to ask uh, everyone um, in this uh, session that the uh, Angelica, Annabelle, Daniela, Nick, um, what your thoughts are on this? What can you do in your own context to contribute to sense of belonging specifically after reflections uh, with this exercise? Um, Angelica, can I start with you? I can start again. Uh, maybe I was already thinking about that as I was scoring. I was thinking, what can we do? What can uh, our university do uh, to promote uh, more and more inclusive and a sense of belonging? Maybe uh, the part of um, uh, have different experiences and uh, give uh, let them talk about their experiences about their uh, point of view not our point of, of view of some things and uh, the sense of the the materials to reflect different stories and perspectives the the learning materials can be more diverse, but I think the, the most important for me was to, to think about how can people be represented by themselves and not by someone else's eyes, but how they can be able and free to talk about their own experiences, their life, their background, and this must matter to our uh, classroom and to our curriculum and to our university and also to our uh, collaborative experience for being here and to be more su support. Not to think that there is a place that they can ask for help, to think that I can also be a, a person that can provide this help and that can moderate this experience. So that's that was what I was I thinking about that we can do about that. Yeah. Great, Angelica. I, I hear you say it's really important to um, engage the people um, that we're talking about and really allow them to speak for themselves, right? And create space to um, uh, have them uh, speak about their experiences and then translate that also to learning material so that their perspectives are included in, in the institution um, in, in terms of curriculum and other uh, resources. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you. Uh, Nick, what are your final um, remarks? Yeah, I, I think um, um, 
in my own institution, well, I've worked for, for a consultancy organization, so we work with different universities, obviously. But uh, I think what is, again, very important that I'm learning from this exercise is that, uh, um, that everybody is unique. And um, even in my own example, when I, when I talk, talked about my former colleague, uh, so a, a deaf British woman, I've also studied uh, with uh, another deaf woman, but she was from a migrant background. And I mean, intersectionality is 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 an important thing. Uh, and for me, that goes hand in hand with having, as also Angelica said, a very um, individual student-centered approach uh, and trying to not think in, in one size fits all, but always try to take all the different identity markers of, of individual peoples into account, but also listen to them and, and, and let them explain what is most important for them. And that is also not always the most obvious. So again, for example, uh, someone who is in a wheelchair, that doesn't mean that their disability is their most important identity market. It can be that they are first generation student or that they are gay, etc. So you need to listen to them and also go out of your own bubble. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to have the experience that I've been, I've learned, get to, got to learn a lot of different people. And I hope that everybody also tries to do that uh, when, whenever that it's possible. Thank you, Nick. So your um, plea for an intersectional approach, I think, is really important uh, indeed to, to highlight that um, there are a uh, unique experiences that people carry with them uh, related to um, experiences also of exclusion. So it's really important to keep that in mind and talk to them with them rather than about them. So thank you. Um, Daniela, your final remarks? Yeah, sure. So. I think uh, because in our university, the population that exists in, in society of Moroccan uh, people, right? They are not represented in the university. So the first step would be to attract them because also if they are not going to university, they are not teachers in the school. So their children do not see teachers who look like them. So this permeates in all levels. So I think the university could be to, could take that role of, of really attracting a diverse student body because everyone benefits from this, right? Not only the minority population, but everyone who's going. Then when discussing topics related to people who are different, the problem is that here, if everyone is from Spain, right? They all look the same. Uh, there is one story we'll go through and that's fine. But when you have people who are different, being able to see all those perspectives is interesting. And uh, that's it, right? Making sure that, that through this education, people can really, uh, people who are different, who come from different countries and are living here can do, do something more than maybe working agriculture or doing what they are doing now, in knowing that there is access to a different type of, of profession. So I think that's important. That would be the first step. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. So also again, the the importance, right, of, of diversity of perspectives and also explore what that means um, in terms of uh, practice. And then, uh, thank you. And then, uh, Annabelle, the final remark is for you. Yes, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, cel celebrating the culture and, and um, you know, very much along the lines of what everybody else has been saying about an in more of an individualized approach and getting to know that person. Because I was applying lots of the, you know, the theory that we that we explore in early years around giving people a voice, ed educating. So I was I was trying to think of, of different ways that we could do that. Um, maybe encouraging people to write about their experiences. I recently um, did a Viva for a young a Muslim girl who um, had been in school on teaching practice, and she. One, I said, what's, your, what's been your proudest moment? And she said um, it was teaching the children about Eid and about her religion, and about her culture. She said they were so excited and they embraced it and they all remembered it. And the parents wanted to talk to her about it. So that that sharing of, of, um, of, of the culture and, and being proud about it, you know, helps to break down those boundaries, doesn't it? And, and inspire other people that, that might not feel that they quite fit in or that they could could do that um i think that's that's really important um and and absolutely you know just resonates with what Danie danielle was how i feel was what danielle was saying about how that diversity is, is just so rich and it's so so beneficial and it's um you know helps to break down that ignorance doesn't it 
Yes, thank you so much, Annabelle. Indeed, uh, diversity is not just something that poses challenges, but it's so um, so much to celebrate, right? Uh, if uh, if we know how to uh, to use that and, um, mm. and to really um, um, empower people, also uh, where they come from and how how that contributes to the learning environment, and in the end, that will also contribute to a sense of belonging if they're able to celebrate where they come from and who they are. Mm. So thank you so much again to Nick, Angelica, Daniela, and Annabelle. I have to apologize to the people at home who filled out their scores and contributions in the chat. I, for some reason, I wasn't able to, to see that, so I couldn't address that now. And unfortunately, we're out of time, so I can't um, come back to that. But I appreciate uh, you uh, joining the exercise with us. I hope it was a fruitful exercise for you. Um, I can conclude, I think, on behalf of all of us that it, it was fruitful for us here in, in this specific session. Um, so now it's uh, back to you, Sophia, for um, continuation. Thanks again to everyone for, for watching. Thank you very much, Pravina. Pravini. Thank you, all of you that participated in this exercise is always amazing to see your reactions uh, and we, we already did this before and it's always so interesting to see how people react to this uh, to this exercise that uh, that uh, Pravini is facilitating yes Angelica we should do this in our faculty more often I think it could be interesting to do this with our colleagues and and, and students as as well